Well, I hope you enjoyed uh, that description of the play Medea. Um, what we're going to do now is talk about dr the dramatic structure. Dramatic structure is how a play is written. Uh, all plays, doesn't matter what type of play, whether it is a tragedy or a, a drama, a comedy, musical, all plays have basically the same structure. And if you understand how a play is structured, it is much easier for you to analyze the play, uh, to figure out what it's all about. And um, it helps to, uh, to enjoy the play uh, more. So um, the lecture that I'm going to, to give you uh, comes from a book by a woman who I took um, dramatic structure from. Her name was Josefina Nigli. Miss Nigley was from Mexico. Uh, she moved to the United States when she was a girl. She studied at the University of North Carolina at Chapel Hill and then uh, went out to Hollywood where she became a screenwriter. She wrote for television and film and she wrote uh, several plays. Most of her plays are uh, about life back in Mexico. Um, but her uh, a lot of her scripts uh, for television and film uh, were westerns, and she wrote for some big ones. She wrote for Have Gun, Will Travel, uh, Bonanza, um, Wagon Train, many, many more. Uh, and um, I was very fortunate uh, to have her uh, when I was a student at Western Carolina University. Uh, Miss Nigley had come there to retire, and they asked her to come and teach some classes and I had her for dramatic structure. Now she wrote a book, it's called Pointers on Playwriting, and it's from that book uh, that I will, uh, that I got uh, the information that I'm about to give you. It's uh, a very easy way to look at a play and again, to analyze it uh, by understanding its structure. All plays have what is called a super objective. Now this is a Stanislavski term, super objective. Um, some directors uh, uh, call it the spine of a play. The super objective, if we're looking for a definition, is the main idea of a play. Super objective, the main idea of a play. In other words, it's the message. It's, it's what we should learn from watching a play. All plays have a super objective. If we go back to the play Medea, which uh, you have now hopefully seen and also uh, you saw the lecture on it, uh, Medea tells us that we do not upset the gods. That's what the Greeks believed. And that we are true uh, to others. Uh, Jason uh, is not true to Medea, and in the end, he is destroyed for it. Uh, uh, again, because he uh, becomes uh, uh, too cocky, too self-assured, uh, all that leads to destruction. Uh, he felt no one could hurt him, and he's proven wrong. The super objective um, is really important because every scene in a play, every actor uh, playing a character in a play, if you understand the super objective, then you try to figure out how your character fits into that super objective. How does your character help tell that story? Um, now, when a play begins or a film begins, they all begin with what we call the exposition. Exposition. Exposition is information that we need that will be important later. 
we get exposition throughout a player film. Uh, if there's an important point, it, it will come up again and again and again. There are basically two types of exposition, scattered and block. Scattered exposition uh, comes in dialogue. You have scenes, and in the scenes, uh, uh, characters are talking about things, and from their conversation, we learn about these people. We learn about their situation. We learn about things that have happened prior to the play. And that information, again, is needed so that we can understand what's going on now. Um, the other type of exposition is called block exposition. And in that, we get the exposition in a big chunk. Usually uh, in the ancient Greek plays, uh, also with Shakespeare, a lot of times you get this in a monologue or a soliloquy. Um, in the, with the Greeks, uh, the chorus often gave us this exposition. Uh, sometimes, though, it might be a character. For example, in uh, Medea, uh, the nurse uh, begins the play and gives us lots of information about what happened to Medea and to Jason up to this point. Um, in many of the Greek plays, though, it is the chorus. The chorus would come out and sing and dance and chant and uh, from that, we would learn the background uh, to what was about to happen. Following the exposition, an event will happen. And again, this is in all films, in all plays. There is an event that takes place that sets the play in motion. It is referred to as a crisis in all plays. Uh, there are usually three crises. This is the first crisis, and we call it the precipitating act. Precipitating act. It's the first crisis in the play. It sets the play in motion. Now, the precipitating act and all the other crises are caused by the character who is the protagonist. The protagonist is the main character in a play. It's the person we know the most about. It is also the person who drives all the action of the play. They want something. They're endeavors to get whatever it is they want drives the play. It is this decision to do something that sets the play in motion. So it's the decision. They want to do something, they make a decision, and now the play takes off. And we have the precipitating act. If you go back and look at Medea, and we try to think, okay, what did Medea do that sets the play in motion? Now, let me back up just a little bit. Medea is the protagonist of the play Medea. I, f I find it funny with a lot of um, ancient Greek plays and also with the plays of Shakespeare, you'll discover it's quite often not hard at all to find out who the protagonist is because the playwrights named the play quite often after the protagonist. Um, Shakespeare, uh, I, I love his, you know, I mean, it's Hamlet, it's Othello, it's... Um, the, the Scottish play, Macbeth, um, uh, Henry the Sixth, Part One. I mean, whoever he's telling the story about, he, he usually named the characters, uh, the main character, that's what the name of the play was. The only time he didn't do this in one of his tragedies uh, which I love is, is Julius Caesar. Uh, Julius Caesar is not the protagonist 
of the play Julius Caesar. In fact, he's not even a main character. Uh, Julius Caesar gets killed in the second act of a, a five-act play. Um, it's a, the, the protagonist of that play is a, is a character called Brutus. Uh, but I think Shakespeare realized if he called the play Brutus, um, no one would know who Brutus was and probably wouldn't come to the play. By calling it Julius Caesar, he, uh, he got better uh, advertisement. Uh, more people came because that was a, a well-known name. Uh, but other than that one, uh, you know, Othello, um, Macbeth, Hamlet, they usually are the protagonist. And that holds true with Medea. Uh, Medea, the protagonist, the person we know the most about. Medea makes a decision early in the play which is the precipitating act. And what she does is she prays to her goddess, Hecate. And that in that prayer, she asks for revenge and asks Hecate to help her do that. And that sets the play in motion. Once that happens, um, there, there's no turning back. The play is moving forward. Now, the other important um, character in any play is the antagonist. The antagonist is the person we know the second most about, and they are the person who opposes the protagonist, who tries to keep the protagonist from reaching his or her goal. I love the film Star Wars. Star Wars uh, is a, a, an epic film, and I, I like my favorites of the first three that were made, which in the story become the last three of, of the six. Um, they're the ones that featured Han Solo. Um, Star Wars, it's, if you look at those first three movies and you say, okay, what character made all the decisions that drive the action of, of all three movies? And when you look at that, it's Luke Skywalker. Luke Skywalker makes all the decisions, and he's helped. He's helped by Han Solo and others. But he is the protagonist. It's his story. Okay. The antagonist, who opposes Luke Skywalker? Now, you probably would think immediately it's Darth Vader. Yes, Darth Vader does oppose him, but he is not the antagonist. He is a substitute antagonist. The real antagonist cannot be there. He's too weak. And he is saved for the very last story and that's the emperor. The emperor hides in the shadows and uh, he lets Darth Vader do his work for him. Uh, and so you have the antagonist and a substitute antagonist. Um, not unusual. Uh, there are a lot of substitute protagonists um, as well in, in many stories. Um, if we go back to Medea, we know that Medea is the protagonist. Who would be the antagonist? Who opposes her and tries to keep her from getting what she wants? And the answer would be Jason. Jason is the antagonist. Medea is the protagonist. So, Medea causes the play to begin, she creates the precipitating act. The play continues. We get uh, a little more exposition. We, lear we learn more about these people. And then finally, about halfway through a play, you have the second crisis. We call this crisis the major crisis. 
The major crisis, again, is a decision made by the protagonist. When that decision is made, there is no turning back. And the play now heads straight for the final crisis. Major crisis caused by the protagonist. Once it happens, no turning back. The play is moving directly towards the final crisis. The major crisis in the play Medea, as you have seen, is when Medea makes the decision, it's always a decision, when she makes the decision to send the golden robe to uh, Jason's new young bride, uh, little Creusa, when she sends that to her, and we discover it sets Creusa on fire, uh, and uh, Creon, the king, uh, tries to save his daughter. He gets stuck to her, and he also catches on fire, and both burn to death. Once that happens, there's no turning back for Medea. Something really spectacular is now going to happen. And we don't know what that is, but we are heading towards it. The action is building, 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 building. Sometime after that major crisis, there is usually a twist in the story. Um, a twist is where the playwright sets you up. You think something's going to happen or the play is going to go a certain way and all of a sudden it changes. Horror movies are filled with twists. How many times uh, does Freddy Krueger, you know, we think he's dead and all of a sudden he reappears. Um, uh, one of my favorite twists of all time was uh, uh, in the film Alien and Sigourney Weaver uh, near the end of that movie, her character, uh, we think, uh, has killed the alien. She's in, a, in an escape pod. Uh, she undresses to go to sleep. Um, she even has a little kitten that she has saved, and she and the kitten are there, and it's so sweet, and we think everything is, you know, we're at the end, and it's all wonderful, and then all of a sudden there's a big drop of goo that comes down uh, and she looks up and there are the teeth of the alien. It's in the escape pod with her. That is a twist. Now in tragedy, in drama, we call this twist a dark, bright scene. A dark, bright scene. It's called a dark, bright scene because we're in a tragedy. Things look like they're going to go bad for the protagonist. Uh, and all of a sudden, something happens, the twist, and it looks like everything's going to be okay. Everything's going to be fine. And for a moment, the audience is taken away from the reality of what's going to happen. The rug's going to be pulled out from underneath our feet and it's going to move in a different direction. So it's a dark, bright scene. In Medea, there's a wonderful scene. Medea has killed uh, her enemies. She knows that Jason has been destroyed by this, I mean, emotionally. Uh, this great hero sat and watched as his young wife burned to death. And Medea is, is good. Uh, she has uh, a, a home waiting for her in Athens. Uh, she has a, well, the Greeks called it a fiery chariot. Uh, ready to take her and uh, to safety. And she calls out her children and she looks at them and 
in the film, she sits down on the steps of her home and she brings the children over to her and she realizes that they're afraid and she begins to hug them and love on the children. And for a moment, we think this mother and her kids are going to be okay. She was wronged, she has been revenged, and she's going to go with her children to Athens and start a new life. But then, she looks into one of the boy's eyes and she says, his eyes look like Jason's. And as long as she can see that, she is never free of Jason. And with the nurse protesting, with the chorus protesting, she picks up her two children, takes them by the hand, and leads them back into the house. The nurse runs up and tries to stop her, and the door slams shut. And then shortly afterwards, something else happens. That is the twist. That is the dark, bright scene in the play Medea. Okay. Following that, very shortly after that, we go to the final crisis of the play. And the final crisis is called the climax. Climax. It's the moment of highest action in a play. The moment of highest action. The whole play has built to this moment. If this isn't the most exciting or most horrible moment in the story, the play has failed. The audience has been waiting for this to happen. It, we've had the precipitating act, the major crisis, and now the climax. In Medea, the climax is when Medea makes the decision to kill her children. Now, the Greeks uh, believe that this should happen off stage, and it does. We hear the screaming, uh, and we know, the audience knows, that the unthinkable has happened. A mother has killed her kids. Well, Jason shows up. He can't get into the house. Finally, the doors open. Medea comes out. And Medea shames him. She shows that he is a coward. Uh, he won't uh, attack her for fear of the snakes that guard her. Um, he asks to have the children stay there with him, and she says, no, because you would defile their dead bodies. I'm taking them with me. The, the children's dead bodies are revealed to Jason, and then she leaves him with a, uh, there's a really nice speech at the end where she tells him uh, that uh, he will die alone on the beach next to his rotting ship, the Argo, and uh, his days of being a hero are over, that she has totally destroyed him, uh, which was her uh, objective all along. And he asks her, he says, you know, why did you do this? And she finally says, I killed them because I loathed you more than I loved my kids. The ending of the play, she, she goes in back into the house and we know that she's going to get on this chariot and ride away. The ending of a play is called the denouement. The denouement. Um, the denouement is simply a summary of the action. Often in the denouement, we are given uh, the, the super objective. Sometimes it's, it's stated in the denouement. But after that climax, we have to have something to wrap up the story. 
And so all plays will end, all films will end with the denouement. And that message is given. I, I recently watched, uh, rewatched The Avengers, the film. And after all the action of that movie, uh, the last thing uh, that we see uh, uh, until the credits come on is uh, uh, we're being told that you know what will happen uh, if we need them they've all gone away all the Avengers have left us uh, what will the world do if if uh, more aliens come or you know something else terrible happens and uh, we are given the message uh, they will come back and why because we will need them um, the denouement, the story ends. Um, all plays are structured this way. Remember, you want to remember the super objective, the protagonist, the antagonist, the three crises, the precipitating act, the major crisis, and the climax. Also remember uh, the twist, which in drama we call the dark, bright scene. And finally, remember the denouement. I'm going to end it there today. I hope this has been informative and that you've enjoyed uh, this lecture. I'll meet you again uh, real soon, and we're going to talk about tragedy. See you then.